Okay, for example, let's start. The travel I don't think we saw it in uh, Facebook. No? What applied to uh, uh, anorexia, bulimia, and uh, other eating disorders? So, less specific, not more the anorexia. Uh, the people who had the idea to, to expand this not only to uh, anorexia and bulimia, but to to all the, the disorders? Yeah. Are you thinking about even psychosis or only anxiety? No, we, I mean, we um, were struck about 10, 15 years ago by the literature at the time indicating the same processes were being identified in eating disorders, in anxiety, yeah. in mood disorders, in psychosis, in personality disorders um, and so we saw these papers coming out individually and they, we therefore conducted a systematic research uh, uh, review to identify whether there was sufficient evidence to suggest that these processes were elevated in multiple different disorders. Um, these are things like thought suppression, selective attention, self-focused attention, safety behaviours, worry, rumination, metacognitive beliefs. We found that all of these processes were elevated in at least four widely different disorders um, and that they'd, actually there'd been no studies conducted that had found an absence of these processes being elevated. Um, so for us, this was really convincing evidence that the processes that maintain psychological distress are the same across these widely different disorders and actually the same in subclinical and non-clinical populations as well. Because all of these processes can be identified in the non-clinical population just to less of an, of an extreme. And uh, I understand that your more personal contribution is that among all these processes, these 12 processes, or so, yeah. you focus on one given process and maybe behind all of them? Well, the, yeah, the reason for doing that, when we produced our systematic review, we provided some implications for yeah. therapy, but we found that it's very hard to form a formulation when you've got a potential dozen or more processes. And more importantly, when you look at the studies and the way these concepts are defined, there's huge amounts of overlap between these concepts. Oh, yes. A thought, thought suppression, safety behaviour, experiential avoidance. Conceptually, they're not as distinct as we might like, and statistically they're not uh, oh, distinct. Yes. Um, so that was one direction. The other direction was, uh, in terms of practical view really, to simplify, the other direction was that myself and colleagues were becoming aware of a psychological framework mm. called perceptual control theory that was gravitating towards a more fundamental cause of psychological distress. And we are interested in bridging that gap. And we are finding good evidence that what makes these transdiagnostic mm. processes a problem, we can explain using perceptual control theory. And I can, shall I explain that to you? Uh, but, yes, let's clarify. Percep perceptual control theory that came from Powers? Yes, it came from a man called uh, William T. Powers, or Bill Powers. Yes. He started working on it in the 1950s from a background in medical physics and control engineering that he was applying the ideas to, to psychology. Um, the first paper came out in 1960, and his book came out in 1973, where there's the most uh, detail on the theory. Yeah, um, Bill Powers himself came up with the uh, idea of uh, the levels back in the 50s, but he didn't publish much on it. There were some things that emerged a few decades later, but it wasn't until Timothy Carey came across the theory and the idea that he worked together with 
build powers to form okay. method levels as a therapeutic approach. And that happens um, about, uh, about a decade ago that it's, that it's started to crystallise into a, a trainable mental health intervention. So would you say that the difference, could, could we say the difference between standard CBT and PCT in a word is not so simple? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, PCT is a, is a single theory, mm -hmm. whereas CBT yeah. is a family of related theories yeah. and therapies. Um, so that's one, I guess that's one point. In terms of if you look at method levels or look at mm -hmm. CBT, in many ways, um, what you'd see in meth part of what you see in method levels is it leaves out a lot of things that CBT might include, like uh, written formulation and thought diaries and formal behavioural experiments. It leaves those out. Mm -hmm. But some similarities you might see in the questioning style and the collaborative stance and the guided empiricism that is behind both approaches. Mm -hmm. But in method levels, we only ask questions and we maintain this empathic curiosity throughout ah. and focus on the present moment of what's happening. Thoughts that come into people's heads. Um, their eyes might move, they might just show some, some a smile or some affect. I'm just ask them about it right then. What's going on right then as you're telling me this? So we're focusing on the present moment. The reason we're doing this is that we're trying to help people's awareness go to where what, what is really at the root of their problems. Okay? Now, what control theory suggests to us is that life is a process of control. Most of this control is happening completely outside of our awareness. I'm talking to you. This is a meticulous controlled process speech. It takes babies and infants and children mm -hmm. years to learn to do it properly. But I can do it smoothly, but it is a controlled process. Um, my posture is controlled, um, and many of my thought processes are, are automatically controlled. So life is this process of smooth control of all kinds of things that are important to us. And the idea is that we manage this somehow by organising control in a hierarchy. We focus on the the long-term goals, you know, um, maybe feeling a worthwhile person, mastery at certain things, um, certain principles we might have for honesty, kindness, and we use those long-term goals to set and organise the everyday things we do. That might set routines, which in turn set how we might manage certain social situations, which in turn might set how we literally manage someone's, you know, reaction to us in that moment. So the idea is that we're this vast network of really smooth ways of, of controlling things for ourselves with other people a lot of the time, and, and which is called collective control. And the idea is that we're only really aware of sometimes how hard it is to control things mm. when it doesn't work, yeah. and suddenly that comes to our awareness, yeah. and it's like, oh, I, I used to find it easy to get up in the morning, and now I can't do it. I used to find it easy to talk to my boss at work, and now I can't face them. Um, so it's when control becomes hard, and it's a struggle, yeah. and it gets stuck, that, 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 that the fact that control is a problem comes into awareness. Mm -hmm. And PCT proposes this is due to conflict. Mm -hmm. It's uh, well, not always, but largely due to conflict, where one part of you wants one thing, and another part of you wants another. So, for example, someone who might get the diagnosis of social phobia mm -hmm. wants to succeed at work, yes. um, but at the same time they don't want to be rejected and humiliated. Yes. So they want to go to those interviews, they want to be liked by their boss, but at the same time they're trying to do all things to try and not be disliked by them, like sort of, yes. you know, getting out the tension, avoidance, mm -hmm. and you know, that kind of thing. And CBT, we're familiar with these yeah. ideas, but it's not put so starkly as, a quest, as an issue of conflict at quite a high level between you know, mastery and achievement versus fear of rejection. And so what we propose is that our awareness will naturally go to those problems and many of us will just think about it, talk about it with friends, mull over it, contemplate, and we'll come up with a solution, we'll say, right, I just need to talk it out with somebody, or 
I just need to start talking with someone who's a bit more approachable, and then maybe it'll be okay. We work out ways of resolving our problems. The idea is that problems maintain themselves and become very chronic and lead to a real loss of control in our lives when there's something stopping us, putting our awareness on that root cause, on those deep goals that are motivating it. It might be that we're in denial that there was even a problem. I try and tell myself that the trauma never happened. It might be that we've just not spent enough time talking and thinking about it and not being asked the right questions. Um, there can be all kinds of reasons why we're not bringing those underlying motives into our awareness. And Method of Levels is a therapy that provides an opportunity for people to do that by providing a, a safe containing environment and by asking asking questions that give lots of opportunities to bring those fleeting thoughts and emotions about those deep goals into awareness and to help the person actually mold them through for themselves and for uh, themselves. So now, oh, it's clear, so you encourage and stimulate the patient using only questions yeah. to, uh, to have a, a larger view Yeah. Of the goals of their life, yeah. and uh, to be more aware that, yes, the general goal of control is our goal, but they must frame the lower levels of control in, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, in order to manage yeah. conflicts between them. Uh, yeah, the root of the problem is that they're, they're deep goals, but it's playing itself out yes. in these situations of their lives. So they have to draw the links between the two and sort of allow their tech awareness to shift between the two. So when something doesn't happen, doesn't work right now, they need to be aware of that, look at it, inspect it, think about it, and then ask themselves, well, what, what's behind this? Why did I want that? And what would stop me from doing this? So it's sort of, it's like an awareness training, really, that we hope happens through this questioning, that people become more aware of present moment attempts to try and manage things, and, and equally, aware of the, the deeper roots of that and where they conflict with each other. And what about the end of the therapy? Well, this is the interesting thing because control theory states that people feel um, well, living is about control, it's about feeling in control, mm -hmm. and that people therefore should have the capacity to, to to regain control of their lives and understand when they control things. Um, and so, in principle, it's the client that knows when they've had enough therapy. Uh, now, there may be all kinds of constraints that operate within services and for an individual therapist that may mean that's not possible, but ultimately we shouldn't kid ourselves that just because someone's had a specific number of sessions, you know, they got the course of 12 sessions, that means they should have recovered. Everyone is different, and there's no evidence that, um, that examines that a certain number of sessions is the optimum. We have to choose certain arbitrary numbers of sessions sometimes to do research studies in a certain space of time to satisfy resource constraints. But method level says that's fine, that's the way that there are limitations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every client is going to be fully satisfied by that course and they may need to, to have top-ups and mm -hmm. seek additional sessions until they get a sense of, I think I can manage by myself now without coming regularly. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the metal levels belongs to the so-called third wave <laughs> of CBT? Or, uh... I think I used to tend to answer yes to that mainly because of the chronology, because we've recently developed it. But now, I'm, I kind of take a stance on this, which is kind of questions the question, if you like. Um, the fact is, uh, if we go back to Beck, first wave cognitive therapy, Beck was helping people to catch automatic thoughts yes that they were fleeting and they otherwise would have not noticed in the present moment and bring them into their attention. Now I think that could have been one of the key insights of cognitive therapy which isn't always um, appreciated. Mm -hmm. But the fact is Beck was doing that back in the 50s and 60s. 
Okay. Um, we've come through a, a process of the behavioural and the cognitive uh, mm. trying to blend themselves, which is the second wave. Um, I think that was a good attempt, but I don't think behavioural theory and cognitive theory actually fit together. Yes. It's just very frustrating, and that was actually what drove me to look for other approaches. And then we see third wave, which are yeah. a wide range of different approaches, often going yeah. back very explicitly to earlier influences, which Beck and uh, behavioural colleagues also acknowledged, such as Western and Eastern philosophy, um, such as attachment theory. Yes. Um, and so I think it's important, and humanism as well, I think it's important that there has been this third wave approach that has woken us up to realise that CBT owes a hell of a lot to so many uh, influences in psychology and philosophy. Um, but when I answer the question for method levels, I have to think, well, it includes aspects that you'd see in first wave cognitive therapy. We, we've written uh, papers on the importance of exposure, first wave method. Yes. Um, but as a technique, we have a different theory as to the way exposure works. If you look at the origins of method levels, they go back to the same time as the first wave developed mm. the control theory ideas. So I, I find it very hard to say that method levels and perception control theory are third wave, or second wave, or first wave, because yes. they um, you can see resonance with each of the um, different waves of CBT. Mm. Um, and so I think we embrace that, but at the same time we say we do have a particular theory and we do have a particular way of mm -hmm. doing things. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry it's a very long answer. Yes, yes. I understand. The third way, the third way is a, a really a huge domain with very different things. You mentioned the people interested in attachment, so in this kind of, let's look for the the roots, etc. And this approach, uh, and other approaches are more interested in something like uh, uh, neo mindfulness yeah. or uh, neo behaviorism, neo behavioral uh, approach, and also this metacognitive. Yeah. Yeah. Very diverse. And Adrian Wells, again, wouldn't necessarily think of his approach as third wave, maybe because of those differences. Thing, as I understand it. It seems so. to me that it's a theory of attention. I feel attention, yes. well, I've talked a lot about awareness, haven't I? Awareness and attention, yes. for sure, that's a really at the nub, isn't it, of a lot of these approaches. I mean, I do think that um, when Beck was doing thought catching, he was bringing attention to fleeting thoughts, and I do think that when classic behaviours to exposure, they're maintaining attention on a certain uh -huh. experience in the, you know, from something in the environment. Mm. So again, I don't think it's unique to the third way that it's that it's focuses on attention. But I do think we need to understand why attention exists and what it is. Yes. And I think if I make yeah. I think I've explained to you why, even from a from a control theory perspective, some ideas about why attention and awareness even operate. They're there to try and sort out the, the messy conflict in, in our lives, mm -hmm. where things that normally run smoothly in a controlled way are you know are disrupted. And we can't we can't change our whole brains all at once. There's no point changing your religion if you want to learn how to tie your shoelace. Okay? You don't want to undermine your whole psyche. You need to focus change on a, on a spot at a time, mm -hmm. see how well that works, and then, and then move it on. So PCT has a suggestion that, that awareness is about that. It's about where change is happening. And um, even though all kinds of control is happening unconsciously, the zone where the way that we're controlling, the way we're managing our goals, the way we're prioritising, that is what, what we experience as awareness. That's, that's what's put forward mm -hmm. by PCT. 
So could we say that the new behavioral approach of Stephen A's values is the thing more closer to the uh, yes and no. Difference and uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Among the other yeah. thing. I think yes in the sense that a value is clearly, mm. or to us, seems to be very uh, close to the kind of deep, long-term mm. uh, way that we might try and control our lives. So at the highest level in our control hierarchy is what's called the, the system concept. It's about how you'd like yourself to be in the world. Um, and I think, uh, and below that is principles. And so I think this idea that, that we try to manage our lives mm -hmm. by living up to certain principles and to try and maintain a certain vision mm -hmm. around the world and certain values will be in part, part of that, I think that, that fits. Um, I think where, where we differ is that, uh, well, a, a few ways. One is that because um, control theory states that behaviour is, is there just to control, just to control our experiences, um, behaviour has to be dynamic and changeable and it has to vary depending on that exact situation in that moment. And if, if behaviour is too learnt, then it becomes constrained. Mm -hmm. And so um, PCT questions the, um, the assumption of behaviourism that there are only kind of stimulus response uh, links, or even, or, or, or even that there are, it's around you know more advanced ideas of of um, outcomes being being learned. Uh, PCT proposes that what we what what we learn is our is our internal reference values. These are the desired perceptual states that we like to experience. Our behaviour emerges as a way to try and fulfil those experiences. And that will be widely varied from individual to individual across different situations, probably accounting for all that comorbidity and change that we see. And if we get too, too, um, if we don't question the assumption that behaviour is learnt, then we are losing sight of the fluidity and the uh, efficiency of, of control and how automatic it is. So um, the basis of the act doesn't question that that behaviourist account, it, it reformulates it in a different way. Um, so that's one, as, that's one aspect. But, but, uh, but that then has an impact on how the therapy is delivered as far as we're aware. Because we're acutely aware of control, we want the client to be in control and as a, as a method levels therapist, your questions are brief but frequent and curious. And you just you just keep on with them ah, and yes. help the client just scaffold their way to a solution. We don't give our opinion, we don't give a yeah. formulation, we don't present interpretations, we don't try and persuade people really of anything. We don't push them up and try and tell them that, that if only they could identify their values and live their life according to them, things would be different. Um, that's not to say that that's mm. not going to work for some people some of the time. It's just that we do it differently. We like the client to maintain control throughout, and we use our questions to, mm -hmm. to nudge them up and do a lot of that process themselves. But this therapeutic style reminds me very much of bigger form, like the mentalization. Oh, yeah. 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 That, so, so the, the yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's interesting is when we, when we do method levels, and there are uh, people put in method levels in YouTube, there are examples online, they look at it and they go, that reminds me a bit of mentalisation, that reminds me a bit yeah. of motivational interviewing, that reminds me a bit of good Socratic questioning, that reminds me a bit of person-centred counselling, and they list a whole load of things that it reminds them of. Um, and we think that's good, because method levels is trying to get at what is the core uh, process across different therapies because most therapies do work. We just think that there's a way of delivering it that's maybe more succinct uh, by, by asking these questions. But we recognise that most uh, theory-driven therapies work 
and sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between them. Um, it's some quite subtle differences are found, but sometimes quite subtle as to what, what where the differences are for certain populations and not others. Um, but the fact that people see resemblance in other therapies is a good thing. We probably wouldn't then wait to too much to resemblances with one approach versus another. Um, but for, I'll put this out there that um, in meta levels, we're raising our awareness through a one to one questioning technique. Maybe in mentalization, people are raising awareness through individuals asking questions between one another mm, around yes. the same thing. Maybe in mindfulness training, people are raising awareness by having a separate little process of noticing thoughts that's outside the session. Mm, yes. And maybe in mindful awareness training and mental cognitive therapy, they're doing it by allowing intrusions to enter and sit in their awareness. So we don't think we're doing anything in practice radically different from these other really exciting therapies, including exposure and thought catching I mentioned yeah. before. But we're just doing it in a, in a conversational way that's very focused in the yes. techniques and we would propose it's very tightly linked to an underlying, underlying theory that we can then use to, you know, to for supervision and for training and to, to guide how we can uh, advance it. Wow. Okay. There's clearly a lot of people that need more sessions. Um, now we don't know whether the people that we struggle with are the same that other therapies struggle with or not. So that's a <coughs> question. Um, but we certainly do find that there are people that need, need more sessions and people that don't get what they need out of it. Um, they are in the minority, fortunately. Um, but uh, if I was to think about what the, what the traits might be, um, Sometimes it might be the person's coming to therapy for a different reason, mm -hmm. other than to talk about their problem. So they might be wanting to, they might want company, or they might want to <laughs> show off in front of the therapist. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it might be a different goal that the client has, other than talking about their problem. It might be that one of the goals behind the problem is so fundamental and important to them that it's going to take a long time to reorganise that. So, for example, a a uh, perfectionist whose perfectionism leads them to be very self-critical at times but they've lived their lives around it, they've become a, you know, a, a very effective manager or artist or, or poet or, or whatever and it's going to take a lot of time to disentangle that perfectionism that has enhanced their lives from the elements of it that are causing a problem. Uh, so I think that's part of it. And I think there's probably another aspect which is around maybe the neurocognitive elements mm. of shifting awareness. Yeah. And I think if a person has spent a lot of their lives not being given the opportunity mm. to talk about their emotions, talk about their present moment experiences, um, and to be heard, mm. then they, they're not going to be, their brain is not going to develop in a way that's, that's easy to do that. Um, and I imagine that there are some clients that this really is going to be a quite fundamental um, shift for them to be able to think in that different way. Um, and I'm convinced that, that that process is reversible for most people, yes. but maybe it takes its part another the third reason why it can take them. But yes, yeah, so I think that's having a different goal having uh, a goal behind a conflict that's vitally important and difficult to let go and finding it, you know, just not having, or find it difficult to shift awareness for whatever reason, shift and sustain awareness for whatever reason, that they seem to be the main three things. Now they may be the things that make it difficult for other therapies as well, we don't know. But as I say, fortunately it's the minority of people. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, see you. Thank you.